Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to discuss quantum computers once again. And specifically, a completely new discovery, where the researchers basically claim a creation of the first ever mechanical qubit, or the fundamental unit in quantum computers, but in this case using mechanical techniques, as opposed to relying on lasers, or various other quantum effects, such as the spin of electrons. And so let's discuss this discovery in a little bit more detail, talk about how this was achieved, and of course talk about why this might be important in the future. But I guess first, if you want to learn about current state of the quantum computing, check out one of the previous videos in the description. In short though, the current state is maybe not that good. But in general, when it comes to quantum computers, when it comes to making them, technically a lot of different techniques can be used because a lot of things exhibit quantum effects in certain conditions. For example, in that previous video, we've discussed some of the new discoveries when it comes to laser-based quantum computers, and there the effect is entirely based on the polarization of the laser and the entanglement of photons. But in theory, over 20 different known techniques could be used to achieve a somewhat similar effect. But quantum computing is still extremely challenging, which is basically the reality of where we are right now. Despite promises of revolutionary advances, and potentially new advances in pharmaceuticals, or even dramatic shifts in how economics work, so far, not a single quantum computer out there, despite the claims, has conclusively achieved what's known as the quantum advantage. Basically, none of them seem to be more powerful or better at things compared to classical computers, and that's despite the claims from a lot of big companies. In other words, even today, no quantum computer can solve a typical computer problem better than a classical computer. Nevertheless, the scientists keep trying, and the number of qubits in a typical quantum computer keep going up. As of 2024, we now have quantum computers with over 1000 qubits. But when it comes to making these qubits, the techniques can be very different, and the results from those techniques will be different too. But in essence, every qubit is basically a kind of a quantum transistor. Mathematically, they can be represented this way. Except that unlike normal transistors, which can be 1 or 0, qubits can be 1, 0, but also something in between. But because a variety of different ways exist to create these qubits, including tiny crystals, or even particles that can become their own antiparticles, the manifestation of these 1s and zeros are going to be very different as well. For example, as I mentioned, in lasers, it can be polarization of light. With electrons or various types of atoms, including ions, it can function using property known as spin, up, down, or something in between. Likewise, we can also use the charge or the energy state, because every single one of these properties will be quantum in nature. They're not just going to have two values, they're also going to have values in between. But depending on what's used, it might be either very difficult to produce or might have some major disadvantages. For example, in certain cases, even though the qubit itself will be super tiny, all of the additional machinery needed to sustain the qubit is going to be massive and very expensive. In other cases, it might be actually much smaller or possibly even fit on your desk, but instead be super slow or maybe even result in a lot of errors. And so after years and years of trials, most large companies like Google and IBM basically settled for superconducting qubits made of different materials. For example, Google uses aluminium, whereas IBM uses aluminium and niobium, with the qubit itself usually being inside of something like this. But because this has to be in super cold conditions in order to become superconductive, this is why they become so large. But in a typical superconducting qubit, we essentially have a really tiny piece of metal that kind of starts to act like an atom, or because it's so cold and becomes superconductive, it starts to exhibit various quantum effects. For example, it starts to possess different energy states, which can then be manipulated using microwave pulses. This is how these computers are normally controlled. And because all of this happens super fast, this is how in theory we can achieve extremely fast supercomputers, assuming they make no mistakes. Except that they do. And because these states are so difficult to maintain, at the moment superconducting qubits are still very far from being practical. Alternatively, instead of using superconducting metals, we can also use trapped charged atoms. And here, instead, we actually start using magnetic fields. Here's one example from approximately a decade ago from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, with the supporting machinery also being much smaller as well. 
And so here we have more of a magnetic machine that controls the states of these ions. The actual control is achieved using lasers. But the problem with these machines is that, despite being somewhat accurate, they're super slow. And so for many of these ion machines, for example the ones using calcium ions or ytterbium ions, in many cases, despite being accurate, the states themselves cannot be changed quickly. And so these have been actually suggested to be used as a kind of a quantum memory as opposed to a quantum computer. And so in essence, despite many different ways of producing similar effects, compared to classical computers, a lot of them have tremendously different advantages and disadvantages. And right now none of them are perfect or even ready for production. And so the question is, is there a way for us to basically maybe find a way to do something better by possibly having high accuracy, but also maybe high speed? And while well, previously, researchers actually proposed that maybe by using vibrations or so-called phonons, the unit of sound, we might be able to achieve something better. But in previous examples, researchers only used various vibrational states of molecules and not necessarily sound itself. Yet in this new study, we might have a really intriguing new discovery where Yu Yang and his team produced the first mechanical qubit, something that looks like this. Although in this case, this is basically a hybrid. It's a device that contains a sapphire chip, but also is connected to a superconducting qubit, which you can see as a great rectangle on the left. But it also includes an oscillator that vibrates and produces phonons as a result of this qubit interaction. Ok, so it might sound a little bit complex and the actual paper is super complex, but let's Eli 5 this. Explain it to me like I'm 5, right? So basically, imagine a tiny drum head, but in this case super super tiny where you need a microscope to see it. But it's also able to produce ridiculously high frequencies. We're talking about billions of hertz. And so here it's able to produce phonons, billions of hertz in frequency, that can then be used to store information. And just like in a regular computer, for example the amplitude can be either 1 or 0 and thus be used to transmit information and to produce very similar pulsations like what you get right now in the classical computer which you're using to watch this video. But in a typical simple drum head, the energy needed to produce one of these phonons is usually the same. Which means that you cannot really distinguish between various states, which is normally crucial in a typical quantum computer. But to solve this, researchers used a very clever trick. They combined this drum head with a previously mentioned superconducting qubit. In this case, the drum head is referred to as H bar, I mean, that's in case you're reading the paper, and it's connected to something known as transmon qubit. There's going to be a link in the description that talks about this in detail, but in a nutshell, a transmon qubit is basically a superconducting qubit, usually operating at very low temperatures, that's able to produce superconductive effects which can then become quantum in nature. So this is of course what IBM and Google use in their supercomputers right now. But in those other superconducting qubits, like I mentioned before, the problem was always they basically just produce too many errors. And that's despite the fact that they're super fast. And so by combining these superconductive qubits with a mechanical drum, researchers actually created something that doesn't produce as many errors and is also able to maintain quantum states much longer. And so here they were actually able to transfer the effect known as anharmonicity, or these quantum effects, into this drum head, which was then able to produce necessary data. Which now meant that this drum head was vibrating not as a result of classical effects, but was also producing vibrations or phonons based on values in between. And this meant that researchers could now use precise microwave pulses to control this drum head as if it was a quantum object. And moreover, this mechanical qubit or this drum head was able to maintain these quantum states for a pretty long time. In other words, it maintained its coherence and could even be manipulated much much easier compared to a typical superconducting qubit. And so here the main advantage of this system was basically that it was no longer sensitive to various types of noises and the quantum states could survive much longer and produce a lot less mistakes. And so since the quantum information could now be stored much longer, if scaled up to a much larger size, this one day could actually become a much more powerful quantum computer, possibly even capable of practical calculations. But despite of this, this is still going to be a huge device, because here we have a combination between a superconducting qubit and a tiny mechanical drum, this basically means that the actual machine would be even more complex than anything produced to date. But the fact that we can actually combine a mechanical resonator with a superconducting qubit and it can maintain its quantum state and even be much better than other computers, 
could one day lead to some major breakthroughs. And even right now, the experiments conducted to date, at least using this particular device, already demonstrated basic qubit operations, including various readouts and similarities to single qubit gates. And so this vibration-based quantum computer could be the technology that we needed in order to solve all of the previous problems with quantum computing. Being able to store virtual qubits for a much longer period of time and resistant to various errors. But obviously this is just the first paper on this topic and there are no follow-ups yet or no additional discoveries or even studies potentially tackling problems. And so we don't really know where this goes yet. All we know is that we're definitely far from having practical quantum computers that you can basically put on your table and maybe enjoy uh, some kind of a miniature universe. Yeah, that's not going to happen anytime soon. But if you want to learn more about the current state of quantum computers, check out our previous video in the description, along with additional discoveries and additional videos, including quantum internet. On that note, once there are some updates, we'll come back and discuss this in the next video. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, Come back tomorrow to learn something else. Support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.